Okay, kids. Now I'd uh, like to be able to announce that you've all gotten a straight A on your papers, uh, but I can't uh, do that yeah, because they're not they're not all they're not all graded. But we're 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 we're, we're in the process of uh, of doing that. My my normal disposition is to give A's, uh, and then what I do is when I hit a particular spot in the essay where I go ooh ah then I have to deduct a, a, a point or two. Okay, now, uh, the, today, today uh, we're going to be taking up the, the essay uh, that I asked you all to read. Uh, I, I talked about uh, last time the fact that our whole course over the 10-week period of the course in the 20 lectures is uh, going to be divided into the three parts. And then in the, the first part... Uh, I pointed out that the, the overall theme of the course that we've got here is to talk about how the Constitution of the United States can play a role in providing tools for us to respond uh, in a, an aggressive and radical way to the onrushing crisis that is going to be confronting you and all of us uh, in the 21st century here uh, in the form of the major global climate change, the rising of a major national security state in the West, uh, and the potential uh, confrontation between the Northern Industrial Alliance that is being formed uh, in the West against the new rising Asian empire, uh, even potentially resulting in a potential thermonuclear exchange with China which they're all trying to kind of whistle past the graveyard right now and pretend isn't going to be happening. Uh, so that that's, that's the overall purpose of the course uh, in that the, the first third of the course, as I mentioned, was designed to, uh, to familiarize you with the, both the nature of the oncoming crisis and the fact that the uh, the education that you have probably gotten up until the time you began this class uh, didn't really uh, tell you what was going on in the world, didn't really share with you uh, an honest vision of what is exactly going on behind the scenes, uh, which are what you have to really come to deal with in order to address this upcoming crisis uh, as distinct from following a set of presumptions that are predicated upon uh, a, a general high school or even early college understanding of the political science uh, functioning in the world. Um, so so the, the bottom line is I'm, I'm focusing now on the fact that there's a, a, an on, has been an ongoing contest going on in the United States since the very beginning uh, of the country as a, as a nation state. Uh, between elements that are still very much in favor of uh, raising up an oligarchy or an elite uh, minority group of people to run the policies of the, of the nation state uh, over and against a more egalitarian, natural law-based uh, populist form of government that is ostensibly the great experiment that we are engaged in here in the country, uh, and that we're emphasizing the fact that the Constitution uh, provides a, uh, a venue uh, within which this contest can be played out in a peaceful manner, uh, with the understanding that uh, I'm going to be successful in recruiting you uh, or strengthening you in the uh, objective of participating on the side of the natural law rooted uh, populist government as distinct from the governing elite. Uh, and so I was pointing out in part one of the course that we find ourselves now here at the end of the Cold War, which is basically uh, coterminous with when a lot of you were born, uh, that we find ourselves confronted uh, with the re-rising of a major elite force here in the country. We hear a lot of talk now about the 1% versus the 99% of the fact that there's a growing disparity 
uh, in income between an ever uh, richer and richer uh, tiny minority and the vast bulk of the people, the diminishing of the number of people that are in the middle class and that are being driven into uh, the lower class, the struggle over whether there's going to be a raise in the, uh, the uh, minimal uh, standard, minimum wages, uh, etc. You hear this going on all the time. Uh, and what I'm pointing out is that this re-rising into a position of an oligarchy in our country is a repeat of a period of time that we experienced here in the country between 1868 at the end of the American Civil War up to 1929, which was the Great Depression in the onset of the Roosevelt administration and a whole series of reforms that were imposed here in North America to attempt to constrain uh, the, the uh, overzealous uh, greed and avarice of this kind of elite in the country. Uh, and that this re-rising of this group after the end of the uh, Cold War, uh, I had attributed to the fact that the Bolsheviks, who had initially generated the, the revolution in Russia, uh, who had pitted themselves dialectically against the capitalist in the Western civilization and their imperial venture, had basically abandoned the field. And so the, the champions of this elite oligarchical vision of, of governance had uh, started to rise to the ascendancy. They engaged in a whole kind of renewed fervor on behalf of that enterprise. Uh, and and uh, so therefore, this, this period that we find ourselves in, that you're born into here at the end of the Cold War, is a, is a replay of that period. And we're trying to look back at this, but with the understanding that I want to emphasize here today, that this contest has been going on since the very beginning. Uh, that the, this, this uh, elite uh, campaign to try to establish this oligarchical government uh, is manifesting in the rise of uh, certain indicia of a national security state. And it's happened over and over again that we'll cover in the, in the course here during this uh, second uh, phase of the course, of the three parts of the course. We'll touch upon these different periods when this group rose into the ascendancy and engaged in a whole series of kind of characteristic activities that we see happening now, uh, in, so that, uh, that this form of government that they're inclined to try to impose is characterized now, since the Civil War, by the, the, uh, the creation of this new uh, business model, uh, this business model of a, of a corporation that the owners of the assets and resources of a given business enterprise can now, uh, in fact, immunize themselves against any personal liability. And the management of that corporation are also immunized against any type of legal civil liability, and that the liability is confined only to the assets of that corporation. And we're going to be talking about it here during the second uh, third of this course, what the re implications of this have been and how that particular theory of government had risen all the way to the point of generating the Third Reich and the fascist uh, form of government, which is characterized by the alliance between corporations and the governing institutions of a state. Uh, so that's, that's what we're, we're going to be uh, talking about. But I, I want to, as we, as we enter into our discussion of the particulars of the Constitution, we went over on, on Tuesday, we went over in kind of a one period time uh, the entire overview of the Constitution, of its structure and some of the basic uh, amendments that have been passed, reserving until the beginning of this next week when we come together again on Tuesday, the beginning of the actual discussion of the particular elements of the Bill of Rights, getting into the First Amendment rights, the free speech, free association, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, uh, and the other specifics of the Bill of Rights that will start that conversation on Tuesday. But what I wanted to do today is I wanted to uh, 
point out that, uh, again, as I mentioned, that this contest that's been going on between the champions of a populist, natural law-based form of democracy, egalitarian democracy, versus the champions of this elite view of governance has been going on uh, since the very beginning. And so what I wanted to do is I, I asked you all to read this particular uh, essay that, uh, that we, we sent to you. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to start uh, this process of having kind of a more participatory uh, kind of class time among ourselves. So what I'd like you to do is I'm going to have uh, Toby uh, register where you're all sitting, if these seats where you are now are, they're about, I'd say 95% uh, all are still sitting in the exact same place where you usually do. A few of you have migrated to a, a, a couple different places. But what I'd like you to do is, if you can, take these seats in the future. So I'm going to be able to become more and more familiar with your names and your location, et cetera. Some of you can try to retreat toward the back of the room from being in the front before, <laughs> but I see you there. Uh, but you can all stay where you, where you are now if you'd like, uh, and we'll prepare this, the seating chart. And so with my apologies for not knowing all of your names yet, uh, I want us to uh, have more participation here today throughout this period. Uh, and then into the, the discussion period that follows it of this particular essay. Now, you can all smile so that uh, so we'll, uh, we'll know. But you, you've, already give, you've already given me your pictures so that we'll, we'll uh, use those. Uh, now, the, the article that I asked you to read is uh, 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 Dr. Colleen Sheehan's uh, uh, major essay that she wrote uh, for the association uh, the the uh, American Political Science uh, Review back in 2004. Now, what I'd like you to do in a, in a, a show of candor, uh, I'd like to have all of you uh, raise your hands who have read the essay as of today. Okay, so we're dealing with about a third. Ra raise them a little bit higher so I can, uh, don't be shy now. Uh, all it means is that I'm going to, uh, pardon? Yeah, the, Ma the Madison versus uh, Hamilton. Just raise your hands up cause, because you're going to be the ones I'm calling on. Because uh, uh, it, 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 it isn't going to do me any good to call on the people who haven't even read it. Uh, so this is a reward for your having done the assignment because uh, I'm going to call on you and you get a chance to really accelerate and get lots of participation points, you see here, for today. Uh, whereas the rest of you... Uh, I'll have to leave that up to Toby as to what he's going to do with regard to the fact you haven't read it. Uh, but this, this is, this is a, uh, an article by, by, by Dr. Sheehan uh, that uh, she was a Smith Fellow at Princeton University. Uh, and there's the James Madison Program for American Ideals and Institutions at, uh, at uh, the university at Princeton. Now, can anybody tell me why uh, it's perfectly to be assumed that there may be a James Madison program for American ideals at Princeton University. Because he went there? There you go. See? There she is again. Okay, you got it. So, no, that's all right. That's it. Because he did go there. James Madison was a student there. He was one of the students uh, who was there uh, studying under, uh, under Dr. John Witherspoon. And as I, as I pointed out, Dr. Witherspoon was there at the university when it was still called the College of New Jersey, and he taught uh, not only James Madison, who went on to become president, but also Aaron Burr and 10 uh, cabinet members of the, of the original United States government. Uh, he, he taught uh, 37 federal judges, uh, three United States Supreme Court justices, uh, 21 United States senators, and 39 United States congresspersons uh, moral philosophy. And he, he taught them moral philosophy rooted in the natural law worldview as conduited to him by the Scottish Enlightenment. And so that Madison ended up becoming known as the father of the American Constitution, uh, and more specifically as the father of the Bill of Rights. 
He was the principal draftsman of the, the Bill of Rights, and he was the major champion of having such a, a bill in the Constitution. Johnny. No, there's, there's been there's been uh, that there's there's no particular university that we've tracked them all to at the time. That one might have assumed that it might have been Harvard University, uh, but that that kind of reputation grew later for Harvard University of basically training people to be governors. Uh, but the we we have we haven't found any specific one yet. But but this uh, this uh, course that he taught. Uh, influenced all of these people to to adhere to this particular view of the uh, of the Constitution and of the uh, concept of natural law, and this essay, uh, this essay that Dr. Sheehan has written, highlights the the confrontation that developed between James Madison uh, and the other adherents uh, to this natural law worldview with uh, Alexander Hamilton. And Alexander Hamilton had been the Treasury Secretary uh, in the early administrations of the, of the American government. And, uh, but Madison went on to become the fourth President of the United States. And uh, he, uh, he had engaged in, in intense combat in conversations and debate with Alexander Hamilton in various forms of public journals that were written that uh, in addition to their having done the Federalist Papers together, actually, prior to the actual <laughs> drafting of the Constitution, they each wrote uh, rather vociferously in, for various publications uh, under different names, uh, and they would confront each other uh, with regard to the policies that they were advocating. Uh, and, uh, and Alexander Hamilton, for example, uh, discusses a lot of very specific things in this essay uh, that he had championed, and that uh, that Madison had opposed. And uh, what what I what I want to do is I want to ask some of you who have read it uh, if you would tell me what you understand from the essay to have been the basic point of contention between Madison and Hamilton. We're gonna rush right in here. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's it. That, uh, that, that Hamilton thought that the, the uh, role of the, of the general population was basically just to listen to the people who were participants in this kind of elite cadre of governors and, uh, and uh, trust them. And then they could sort of pick which of those uh, uh, members of the oligarchy they happened to agree with and that that was all they had to do. And then they'd vote for the ones they wanted and they'd vote for them every four years or two years, and that that was basically their, the end of their responsibility. <laughs> oh, okay. You just had that expectant look. It, okay. That, uh, and whereas uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, Madison was, uh, was very clear that he thought that the American people had to not only educate ourselves adequately to choose our leaders uh, four years and two years, uh, but that in fact we ought to, there ought to be developed some better and better way by means of which we could participate uh, in the day-to-day -day governing activities of the country. And he pointed out that <clears throat> this was a, a challenge because of the lack of certain means of communication at the time. Uh, the long distances that existed between Washington, where the representatives would go and all gather together, uh, and, the, uh, and the ability of people to leave and go and spend any time there, where they could actually talk to the representatives. 
And this obviously is all prior to the existence of electricity and, and telegraphs and, uh, and uh, telephones and, and, and other means today. But he, he was pointing out how he thought that there, the real challenge that faced the, the experiment in popular government that was represented in his mind's eye in the Constitution was how we could better and better uh, effectuate the ability of us as the population to participate in these day-to-day -day decisions. And that was, but, but uh, Hamilton didn't even think we ought to be doing that. He thought that the, the, the general populace was uh, stirred by passion and ignorance uh, and that uh, they would tend to break into emotional factions uh, and that it would, uh, it would disenable the federal government to be able to really have any kind of consistent set of policies if they were being governed by the rabble, as it were. And, uh, and so he, he was very emphatic about that. But it took, it took a certain set of forms that had been raised uh, in, the, in the essay by Dr. Sheehan can anybody tell me what one or more of the particular proposals were that Hamilton had been making uh, that, was, that was reflective of his particular attitude toward, toward government? Uh, the the yep. Uh, okay, we, what other ones? He, he was a champion of having a national bank. That was one of them. Were, were there any others? Okay, well, one, one of them was he wrote, he wrote a report on manufacturing. Uh, and what he was proposing is that the federal government, uh, in, in some part through the activities of a national bank, engage in giving loans and subsidies to the major uh, manufacturers and the industrialists uh, in, the, in the new American government. Uh, and that by, by moving money in a preferential way toward the industrialists, that uh, this would in fact stimulate the economy, generate uh, wealth, and that this would in fact enrich the country in general. And uh, it, it turns out that Madison was adamantly opposed to that. Uh, he thought that setting up such a bank and giving it the power to give loans in a preferential way to these industrialists uh, was in fact not only unfair in that it was giving preference to one group or faction over another, but he thought that it was the road to perdition. Uh, that in fact, this, that manufacturing, he thought, he said, and he, in, uh, Dr. Sheehan cites him in her, in her essay, in uh, numerous uh, publications that he, uh, he had written for, in which he said that the manufacturing uh, sector of the community tends to manufacture things that aren't really necessary, uh, that they're, they're superfluous, as he reported, that, and they're frivolous, uh, and that, the, that if you have a, uh, an industrial class that is devoted to trying to make profit by taking resources and transforming them into these commodities that they'll make available for people, that they're going to have a tendency to want to generate a demand for what they're producing uh, independent of whether or not the people really need it. And therefore, it's going to cause kind of a degeneration on the part of the public uh, in their character to be, to be driven to try to get money, to buy things that they don't need, simply to fuel the in industry that is getting all of these subsidies by the National Bank to produce more materials. And uh, in Madison, actually, uh, the, Dr. Sheehan points out that Madison went so far as to say that he thought that there was something intrinsically more valuable to the agrarian uh, endeavor, that the entire uh, uh, activity of farmers growing food and providing essential uh, uh, nourishment and stuff to the people uh, actually was much more consistent with the type of popular government that he saw as being a major objective of the Constitution. Uh, and, and he also pointed out that the, if there was a national bank like that and that they were giving loans, preferential loans to the industrialists, that that was going to cause the industrialists to start having much greater levels of influence on the policies of the government than the people who lived in the rural areas were going to have. 
and that you were going to start generating an elite class of people uh, in the country that were, were differentiated from the great masses by their ever accumulating wealth. And that these, these more and more wealthy people were going to have more and more influence over the policies of the federal government. And the federal government was going to come to dominate uh, the policy making of the country. And that that was not intended in the Constitution. That the Constitution, as Madison talks about in the article, was designed to facilitate uh, activities among the states. But it wasn't designed to make policy of some common kind for the entire country. Uh, and he goes on to point out uh, that, that the, uh, the lending of this money to the, to the industrialists was going to be generating a bigger and bigger debt uh, that the country was going to be carrying. And that this debt was going to cause the banks to become more and more powerful, more and more influential, uh, and, and he actually pointed out that, that he didn't even want, uh, and, and it's interesting because the, one, of the, one of the characteristics of this debate that went on between Madison and Hamilton was that they were both being uh, uncharacteristically candid about their respective points. And uh, for example, uh, uh, Alexander, Alexander Hamilton was saying that it would be a good thing to have these industrialists become more and more powerful, and it would be a good thing for the, the, the government to have more and more power, the federal government, because then they could fund wars. And, uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Madison pointed out that if, in fact, you gave more and more power to the federal government, they were going to be more and more inclined to have more wars. Uh, because they would be going after the resources that the industrialists wanted to have to manufacture their goods. Now, this right away starts to take on kind of a, an interesting uh, character, this whole discussion at that point in time, because you can see it not echoing arguments that were to be made later, but preceding the arguments that you're going to start hearing later about the role of the military in the federal government uh, being financed by a central bank making war uh, in different parts of the world to garner the resources to give to the industrialists. And he also points out, Madison points out, that these industrialists who are going to be getting more and more loans from this national bank and strengthening the federal government are going to have the ability to corrupt the legislators that the legislators uh, uh, are going to become more and more subservient to the executive branch because the executive branch is going to be controlling the bank and deciding who gets the loans and is going to be start garnering more and more power, but that the banks and the wealthy are going to then start to corrupt the legislature. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that this, these, these themes are now are being sounded right at the very beginning of the entire United States government. So this debate that you hear going on even today about the growing role of corporations uh, and the whole issue of the national debt uh, and, the, and the level of taxes that are going to be paid by corporations or the wealthy, that these, these arguments that are salient today actually began right at the very founding of the country. Yes, Sophia. No, but they, what they did is they, they, they were talking about the industrialists, that the, the banks, the, the actual corporations came into existence after the, not coincidentally as it turns out, uh, after the American Civil War. Because as I pointed out uh, yesterday, or on Tuesday, that the American Civil War was not in fact just about freeing the slaves. The uh, American Civil War was in large part about establishing the hegemony and dominance of the industrial uh, elements of the country over the agrarian elements. And this, this theme is, is discussed in some detail uh, in the debate going back and forth between Alexander Hamilton uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, Madison in these, in these various essays that they wrote publicly uh, criticizing each other's position. 
And so this, this, uh, this question about the corruptibility of the legislature, the tendency on the part of uh, such a system to strengthen the executive branch uh, over the, uh, the legislative branch, the tendency of, uh, of such a set of policies uh, generating more and more wars because you would have to build more commodities to provide to the war machine, generating more debt for the country to borrow the money to build the war machinery, to have the, to have the war, that this entire set of issues has been raised now right at the very outset of the entire history of our country. And so the, the reason that I raise it is I don't want us to be deceived into thinking that these issues came to the fore only at the end of the American Civil War, or that the debate that later went on between Franklin Roosevelt uh, and after the Depression uh, in his confrontation with the major industrialists and the bankers uh, was something brand new, or that the major issue, for example, right at the beginning of the Obama administration, where you found that the major banks uh, were engaged in this whole process of enriching the wealthiest people in the country and that they actually threatened to bring down the entire government uh, unless, the, unless the major debt that they had built up was paid for by the American taxpayers. Okay, so that this, these issues that have, have dominated the news uh, all during just the most recent administration uh, of the Obama administration in fact, are, are not only foreshadowed, but they are indeed forecast uh, by this debate that went on between Madison and Hamilton. So I, I want you to read this. Uh, now, did, did anybody attempt to find the essay and was unable to find it, to retrieve it? Or is it just that you just haven't gotten to it yet? Okay, all right, so look. So again, I'm, I'm not a hammer. On this, uh, what, what I am is I'm trying to I'm trying to kind of be a helpful coach for you to to get the information to you that you'll want to be able to see to find out about this because that this fundamental debate that went on between uh, Madison and Hamilton, as I said, is a is a precursor and a predictor of exactly the same kind of issues that are still being fought uh, and. The, uh, an, another, one, another one of the major issues that was raised uh, that, that they differed on was, was this issue of the Alien and Sedition Act, that the, uh, the executive branch advocated uh, a, the, the passing of alien and sedition laws that actually punished speech that was undertaken by citizens in opposition to the policies of the executive branch, that they actually had a, a federal statute uh, uh, prohibiting this. And, uh, and Madison was, was adamantly opposed to that, saying it's transparently violative of the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, uh, in, the, in the freedom of the press. There were restrictions against the press uh, publicly criticizing the administration's positions, et cetera. And Alexander Hamilton was one of the major champions uh, of the Alien and Sedition Act. Uh, and so that this debate went on back and forth between Madison and Hamilton as well. Uh, and then there was another issue that arose is that even under the very first administration of George Washington, what happened is that in the, the rebel, remember now that that one of the things we touched upon is that the exact period during which the Constitution of the United States was being drafted in, in 1789, the actual first three articles, then 1791, during that exact period here in the United States, Europe was experiencing the French Revolution. And the, the revolutionary government that came into power in France uh, declared war on Great Britain. And George Washington, in 1793, in just the first administration, from, from 1789 to, to, uh, to uh, 1793, during that first administration, Washington issued a proclamation. George Washington issued a proclamation declaring that if any citizens participated in any way in supporting the French or the British in that war, that they would be punished 
by, by federal criminal sanctions. And so in, in, uh, immediately, Madison uh, took to the hustings and started publicly condemning that, saying that that was a clear usurpation of power on the part of the executive branch because in the, uh, the Constitution itself, in Article I of the Constitution, there's a specific provision that says that the Congress of the United States has the power to declare war. And so that the President of the United States taking steps to basically prevent anybody from participating in speaking out on behalf of one side or the other of this, this combat in Europe was a, was a crime was violative of the separation of powers. That if the United States wanted to take an official position, that we were to remain neutral on, in regard to that, that war, that the Congress had the exclusive authority to make that decision, not the President. Whereas, not unexpectedly, Alexander Hamilton took the opposite position, that that was an entirely appropriate thing for the President to do, uh, they argued that uh, since he had the uh, initial authority to enter into treaties, even though they had to be ratified by the, by the Congress, he had the right to take the initiative to, to say what the policy of the United States was going to be with regard to those two countries uh, under his treaty-making power. So you see right at the very beginning uh, of the history of the United States, some of these issues start to surface about what type of uh, uh, discretionary authority the president has in the area of foreign policy, uh, what type of authority Congress has, what de to what degree is Congress willing to endorse what the president says. Uh, and so these are, these are, uh, are issues that, uh, that, were, that were specifically going on between Madison and Hamilton in these public policy debates that were going on and on. Uh, now, there, there are numerous places uh, in the body of the, of the essay that uh, we can direct our attention to, but I, but I don't, I don't want to get into, you know, kind of, you know, uh, splitting hairs uh, in the article itself, especially since like more than two thirds of you haven't read it yet. Uh, and oh, I don't, I don't want to get into talking in detail about it uh, when you haven't even read it yet. But, uh, but I do, do want to direct our attention to, to a handful uh, of, of these things, of, of the issues here, that, uh, that Alexander, Alexander Hamilton actually uh, criticized Madison, uh, saying that, that he believed that the Democratic-Republican uh, contingents, Jefferson, Madison, Aaron Burr, and those other people, he actually said that they embraced what he called a naive democratic optimism uh, that had in fact arisen across the seas and was a, a reverie of a false and new fangled philosophy. Okay? So the, the, they actually, uh, the, the, the fellow who was the Secretary of the Treasury uh, and the fellow who went on to become the President of the United States were engaged in this public debate uh, in, the, in the press uh, about the issue of this newfangled philosophy uh, that in fact was being espoused by the advocates of natural law. Uh, and, and Hamilton was self-consciously condemning that newfangled philosophy. And so he was, he was stuck on the basic philosophies that were supportive of the British government. In fact, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a point here where it, it points out that Hamilton had even, in the course of the constitutional uh, debates that were going on in the Continental Congress with regard to the drafting of the Constitution, had actually said that he thought that the British form of government uh, was, uh, was in fact the, the best that could possibly be imagined. And that he thought that this newfangled philosophy that had been, was being espoused by uh, Madison and the other advocates of natural law was in fact going to lead the country to, to destruction. And he said, uh, uh, and, and he, Hamilton, and, and you see it in, I'm just reading for certain sections of the essay, says, Hamilton believed that the attainment of American glory 
was contingent on increasing the power of the federal government and tying the interests of the government to the moneyed class, thereby achieving economic prosperity and political stability and strength in the nation. So you see that this is a, this is a very conscious uh, philosophy that is being advocated by Alexander Hamilton. And that, that's a, that quote's on page uh, 414 uh, of the essay, where he, where he uh, openly uh, advocates the, uh, the pursuit of American glory uh, and that this would be uh, achieved by linking the increased power in the federal government with the interests of the moneyed class. So, so you can see that he's not bashful about what it is that he is saying there. In the, in the, in the, same, in the same paragraph, it says, Madison argued that the institution of a national bank, for example, was explicitly contrary to the Constitution. And Hamilton's proposal to establish the bank uh, was the use of unconstitutional means to accomplish an unjustified end. In Hamilton's report on the manufacturers went even farther. It proposed the national exercise of power to achieve uh, the dominance of the United States, to, to rise in power in the world. And so that this, this entire sense that you have on the part of Hamilton that somehow the moneyed class uh, supported by a national bank uh, ought to be getting loans to help the manufacturing industry to manufacture including weaponry to make it easier for the United States to conduct wars to be able to establish this position of power in the world vis-a-vis -vis other nation states. So that, that, that this, is, this is a precursor of exactly what you heard in immediately at the end of the Cold War uh, by this group called the Project for a New American Century. Uh, that that uh, immediately after, I've, I've touched on this before, but that uh, on December 31st of 1991, with the voluntary dissolution of the Soviet Union, the very next week, in the first week of January of 1992, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, under Richard Cheney, who was the Secretary of Defense, for at that time George H.W. Bush, the President, they gathered a group in the West Wing of the White House, uh, David Addington, David Fife, uh, Elliot Abrams, uh, and, uh, and uh, others. They, they gathered in the West Wing of the, of the White House, and they actually crafted, I pointed out, the first draft of the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Planning Guidance Document, in which they openly advocated that the United States uh, arm itself up more powerfully to establish a new American century of dominance, uh, a full spectrum dominance, in fact, and that they were, they were as aggressive and clear about their enunciation of these principles as had been Alexander Hamilton uh, back uh, in the in 1790s, you know? That uh, this is, this is a, a very important thing for you to keep in mind so that these, these people, such as, uh, such as Paul Wolfowitz and, and Dick Cheney and, and Douglas Fife and these others, are no more traitors uh, to the United States than was Alexander Hamilton. That they were openly advocating simply a, a different role for the, the federal government and the American government. They wanted to have a powerful military presence in the world and it was linked directly to the, the economic interests of the moneyed class. Didn't, uh, on the outset of his presidency, Eisenhower give a warning about the military industrial complex? Oh, yes, he did. That's he, he was, he was, he was very conscious about that. He was, he was, he was very conscious about that. That, uh, that, in fact, uh, Truman, who had preceded Eisenhower in the presidency, uh, taking over as vice president for Franklin Roosevelt when Roosevelt died in 1945, Truman, had been talked into signing the National Defense Authorization Act, creating the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Council, the National Security Agency, and others. And he stated later uh, in a major article that he published in, uh, in the state paper at home that it was the biggest mistake he'd ever made. 
uh, that it was, a, it was a terrible thing for him to have done that. And that, that, whole, that whole momentum that built from 1947 all the way on into the Eisenhower administration is what Eisenhower was talking about. He had seen this power grow uh, and that this was, the, this was the, a very specific uh, uh, high moment if you will, for the ascendancy of the national security state. When, when you have the National Security Council, the National Security Agency under the National Security Act, uh, you have to start getting suspicious that you're looking at a national security state. You know, that, that, that's, what, that's what this is. These, these were the, the instruments of a national security state. And, uh, and when, as I pointed out, when they were exposed, when that first draft of that was exposed, because they, they got a copy of it at the Washington Post and, and uh, they printed a major editorial against that declaring that to be a resurgence of the robber baron era. That, that entire period between 1868 and, and uh, 1929 when these uh, captains of industry, uh, J.P. Morgan of the J.P. Morgan Guarantee Trust, the Rockefellers of Standard Oil, New Jersey, and Standard Oil, California, uh, the E.H. Harriman, uh, the owner of major railway uh, powers, uh, J.P. Uh, Morgan, uh, the major bankers, et cetera, the, 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 uh, the heads of uh, Brown Brothers Harriman uh, and the other major investment companies, when they all, uh, they all, in fact, were joining together to try to, to basically mili raise a military coup against Franklin Roosevelt because Franklin Roosevelt had turned on these people after the major depression and had tried to rein them in and control them. And so that it was at that point, it was at that point in 1929 when the entire uh, fabricated uh, economy of that, that particular moneyed class in the banking system had become so unstable uh, because of the pursuit of greed and the extension of more and more loans to the moneyed class so they could buy more and more stock and, and become more and more wealthy, uh, it, it basically collapsed. And Roosevelt took the steps to try to constrain them. And, uh, and that, that is what, in fact, ended up uh, preceding the major Second World War, okay? which we'll, we'll touch upon in, in some detail uh, in, in the second half of the second third of the course. Okay? But you, you, you see these, you see these uh, statements throughout here. He said, in uh, uh, Matt, James Madison, it said, uh, again on page 414, he viewed Alexander Hamilton's construction of the Constitution as more than just a technical point of law. It struck at the very philosophical foundations of the Republican form of government set forth in the Constitution of the United States. And it's true. Uh, it, from a point of view of a natural law perspective, it did strike at the very heart of one of the major principles of the Constitution. But what, what Madison is tending to give less emphasis upon is in fact that in the first three articles of the Constitution, it's absolutely clear that there is a form of elite that are being actively endorsed uh, in the framework of the Constitution by denying the people the right to participate in electing the president denying the people the right to participate in the electing of the senators, the delegation of authority uh, to, the, to the federal government away from the states where the people have actually selected the legislators. You know, there are all kinds of elements, to be perfectly honest and candid, uh, in the, the, the first half, part A of the Constitution, the Articles uh, 1, 2, and 3, there are all kinds of non-democratic, elite, kind of oligarchical, uh, qualities uh, to the Constitution, and so, so when when uh, when Madison attacks Hamilton, saying that his whole philosophy of the of the Constitution strikes at the very philosophical core of the, the Republican form of government, uh, he is he what he's doing is he's advocating one particular side of this bipolar debate uh, that is going on. Uh, in, uh, Ham he, he actually went as far as to say, uh, Hamilton's interpretation of the Constitution effectively removes all limitations on the power of the federal government uh, in undermining the core principles of Republican uh, government. That's what, that's what he said. 
Uh, and uh, he says, there's this other paragraph, he says this, from Madison's perspective, this is on 415, it says, from Madison's perspective, Alexander Hamilton's lack of respect for the authoritative opinion that informs the Constitution on the part of the public and his determination to substitute his own economic vision uh, it was the crux of their political division. And so, so they, they say this over and over again in the essay. Yes? Okay, so like what I hear you saying is that like Hamilton is uh, arguing for like an oligarchy, or like a elitist class, or like capitalist industrialist class. Yep. Um, but like I'm, I'm still not too clear what Madison is arguing for. Because he's arguing for the Constitution, but in the Constitution it also gives way for what Hamilton is trying to do. That's right. Well, for example, one of the I'll, I'll point out a uh, a thing where a thing that uh, he had he had argued here, where Matt Madison actually argues about designing. Uh, this is that point that you raised. Uh, it was a subset of you saying is that uh, that uh, Madison was seeking particular concrete ways to increase the ability of the public to formulate their opinions and to express their opinions and get those translated back up to support a popular form of government. And he actually, he had actually uh, drafted a, uh, a, a set of provisions in which they would, they would go down into the, uh, the, the local communities. Here it is right here. This is on page 420. It said, uh, he, he, Alexander, or, or Madison argued, there was no reason to adopt Hamilton's servile response to British commercial dominance and allow the empire to treat the United States as a continuing British colony. Commercial retaliation on the part of the new government against Britain would force a change in their trade policy and would actually open up other markets such as to France. And to they, you could substitute those gains for the losses that were suffered from the Anglo-American in commerce. Madison attempted to counteract what he referred to as the Anglican Party. He kept, he kept referring to, uh, to the Federalists and Alexander Hamilton as the Anglicans. Uh, uh, he said that he and James Monroe, uh, James Monroe produced a model resolution to be distributed to all county meetings, the object of which was to provide a means to mobilize, collect, and manifest the real sentiments of the people. That is, that agricultural, uh, that is, the agricultural and community-based part of the society should be empowered to negate the counterfeiting of public opinion coming from the nation's commercial centers. Uh, this is a nation whose citizens depend for their livelihood on the manufactured production of superfluities, super, he refers to them as, anyway, superfluous uh, products, uh, uh, in the whims of fancy. Uh, he said, this is unhealthy. Madison claimed that, uh, Madison claimed is one in which one class of citizens would live in servile dependence on the other. Madison did not share Hamilton's dream that America should become an industrial prodigy. Instead, he believed that agriculture was the most beneficial object of human endeavor. Okay, so that you see here that, that uh, Madison is actually drafting up resolutions, proposing that they go down to each county in the country for them to gather and, and articulate their opinion to be able to move it back on up to the federal government to try to facilitate the citizenry participating not in just elections every two to four years, but in participating more actively in the day-to-day -day running of the government. Yeah, like, what, what was the extent of efforts to, uh, to educate your community about the Constitution and, and sort of uh, the political debate going on uh, in your county? Like, trying to educate them yep. about the people. Yep. So well, Ma Madison, Madison was advocating that this be done through the newspapers that he wanted to have what he called the educated class write for the newspapers so that they could be distributed among the regular people so they could know more about the Constitution, they could know more about the process, this resolution that he had proposed of having county-based gatherings, uh, et cetera. He was, he was really quite concrete about and quite radical about his, uh, his belief that this is how the government should be run. Okay, Sylvia. Wasn't 
Hamilton in his own way also arguing for economic independence from Britain because his whole thing was that he wanted the United States to be a manufacturing power, which sounds actually more akin to what Britain was at the time mm -hmm. than it. So I would have figured that Hamilton held the views he did because he thought that it would help America gain economic independence from Britain. So I don't really feel like, I, I think both thought they were helping the United States gain economic independence. Is that correct? Oh, oh yeah, no, no, that, that's true. And, and, and that's, that's one of the things that's important to, to point out here. The, the fact is, it didn't make Alexander Hamilton a traitor in any way. He just had a completely different theory about how it would be best to strengthen the United States. Uh, and he thought that it would, I mean, actually, he's proposing major financing of military power on the part of the United States. That clearly is suggestive that he, is, he supports the United States being a, an independent nation state from Britain. But what it was is that he thought that the form of government that Britain had, in which there was this kind of elite governing class of people, there were the House of Lords in the House of Commons that, that had, had uh, virtually, the, the, House of, the House of Lords was not selected in any way whatsoever by the people of England. It was completely hereditary and it was based on wealth. And so that, so that it's true that, that Hamilton was, he, he wanted us to remain what he called subservient, or at least it would, which what Madison referred to, he said, he says there was no reason to adopt Hamilton's servile response to British commercial dominance. What, what, uh, what Madison was actually proposing is that there be retaliatory steps taken uh, on the part of the United States, basically in the form of tariffs to, to put taxes on materials that were coming in from England uh, in the same way that England had tried to put taxes on the colonies to actually retaliate against them and to protect our industry and to protect our, uh, our farms. Uh, and, uh, and, but, but Hamilton went on to write up this major report, report on manufacturing in which he explicitly advocated publicly that the United States establish the National Bank and extend loans on a favorable basis to the industrialists. He was very clearly attempting to develop an industrial base in the United States. So you're right in the sense that that was a form of competition with the industrial, uh, industrial markets in, in, uh, in England. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, there's, I say there are numerous, you, you can, what, what, I, what I did, which you can see here, what I did is in, in the essay, what I did here, and this might be helpful for you, is I, I highlight uh, the sections that are saying things that are directly pertinent to understanding what it is she's saying in the essay. In all of the sections where it sets forth what Madison believed, I've underlined in red. In all of the sections that underlined what uh, Hamilton was saying, I've underlined in blue. And so that you can pull it out and take a look at it, and you can say things like, for example, uh, the Federalist measure restricting the freedom of the press. This is the, uh, the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, the Federalist measures restricting the freedom of the press was based on an entirely different non-Republican political model, yet another manifestation of their proclivity to imitate the British form of government. Hamilton, Adams, and their cohorts would place the censorship power in the government over the people, whereas uh, the censorship power was to reside in the people over the government and not in the government over the people according to Madison. Uh, and it goes on to say, and, and Madison starts using this language here where he's, he's in Madison's view, the, the, the role of the people is absolutely indispensable to the proper formation of public opinion. The influence on the ideas and manners of the people can serve to anchor the Republican citizenry in the moral principles of free government. And he went on to use various types of language in his articles that, that Dr. Sheehan points out. It says, Madison's repeated use of language of agriculture in manufacturing in his description of the highest aims of the new republic was no accident. He intentionally meant to contrast his vision of the American Republic and its hero, the, the merchant of ideas, 
and mores uh, to contrast them with the narrower Hamiltonian emphasis on commercial material exchange for private profit. The energy Madison expended to stop Hamilton's economic and political policies was proportionate to the threat that he perceived. Hamilton's program would destroy the limitations on the federal government established by the Constitution and would undermine <coughs> the rightful authority of public opinion in the American Republic. <coughs> anyway, the, <coughs> I don't want to have to waste my time reading it to you, uh, even though you haven't read it. I don't want to overemphasize my displeasure on that. Uh, but I want to make sure that you've got some information with which we can dialogue here. Yeah. <coughs> Oh, they were very close together. That, that, that Jefferson and Madison together founded the Democratic Republican Party in opposition to Alexander Hamilton. In fact, uh, Madison was Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State from 1801 to 1809. And then, uh, and then so, so that they were basically shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder buddies in this entire thing. That whole concept of Jeff, it's, it's become known in kind of on a superficial level as the concepts of Jeffersonian democracy. Jeffersonian democracy versus the Federalists. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm calling out Alexander Hamilton as being the major public proponent of those types of Federalist uh, ideals. Uh, it, said that, it said here that uh, Hamilton's economic and political policies, uh, that uh, the energy extended by Madison to stop Hamilton's economic and political policies was proportionate to the threat that he perceived them to, mi to make. Hamilton's program would destroy the limitations on the federal government established by the Constitution and undermine the rightful authority of public opinion in the American Republic. The thrust of Hamilton's financial and political package was the creation of a system that promoted inequality of property by governmental actions and tied the interests of the favored opulent class to the national federal government. Madison believed that this clever scheme would have the effect of strengthening and consolidating the power of the national government and undermining the constitutional limitations placed on its authority by the, con by the Constitution. The concentration of power at the national level would diminish the power of the state governments, and the power of the national executive would unduly grow and open the way for legislative corruption and render less effective the voice of the people. Hamilton's plan would eventually transform the executive branch into one of unlimited discretion in opposition to the will and subversive of the authority of the people themselves. Ultimately, it might even produce an effective universal silence on the part of the people, leaving the national government to act independently on the will of the society and free to pursue its own self-directed course based upon the interest of the moneyed class. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, it's only because it should. Because this is exactly the, what's going on now with the right-wing elements in the Republican Party. Subsequent to the collapse of the Soviet Union, They've been coming on strong, and they have felt authorized to basically reassert this exact kind of Hamiltonian uh, set of ethics that actually rose into the ascendancy during the robber baron era. And so what I'm saying is that, that while I'm going to, in this second third of our course, you know, consistently condemn that point of view, uh, I don't want you to think that the people that are advocating that point of view now have no historical precedent. And, and it's not just the historical precedent of the Third Reich. You know, that these, this is an element that's been inside the, the major founding fathers and, and leaders of our country ever since its foundation. And so that this dialogue between the two worldviews uh, is, is, is an extremely important one. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's, one, there's one big long paragraph that I would have, I would have assumed that you would have 
jumped right on, and all of you raised your hands to read it out to me, if you'd read it. Uh, but it says, it says uh, Madison it said, uh, Madison clearly understood that the continued commercial relations between the United States and Great Britain were, in fact, critical to the success of Hamilton's financial program. If Hamilton was willing to maintain America in a position of economic subservience to the British and sacrifice our national interests in order to advance short-term commercial gains on the part of the moneyed class, Madison was not. Madison believed the economic, political, and moral strength of the United States was tied to achieving a non-subservient, independent economic position. Madison argued that the establishment of a, bene of a beneficial, or at least equitable commercial policy with the British would take fully into account Americans' preeminence in agriculture and Great Britain's dependence on American agricultural pro produce. While England depended on the United States for the raw materials used in her primarily manufacturing industry, uh, her other colonies, uh, from which she drew immense income, would be dependent on the provision of foodstuffs from the American economy. There was no reason to adopt Alexander Hamilton's servile response to the British commercial dominance to allow the empire to treat the United States as a continued British colony. And that's what they say, commercial retaliation against the British would force a change in their trade policies and open other markets, particularly that to France. Uh, he said, uh, and then they go on to talk about the fact that he had, he had drafted up with James Monroe this proposal that we have a formalized process of going back into the counties all across the country to garner their information and positions and communicate them regularly to the government in Washington. Well, that, that uh, there are a few options. That if if uh, if the United States hadn't done this, uh, they almost certainly would not be the major economic and military hegemonic power that we are today. Uh, as to whether or not we would have been overthrown by some other major hegemonic hegemonic force is is not clear. That uh, the the uh, United States back when. The First World War broke out. When the First World War was going on in Europe, if in fact the United States uh, had not intervened, uh, it's probable that Germany would have prevailed. Uh, it's abundantly clear in, sec in the Second World War that Germany would have prevailed. I mean, uh, you know, when, when uh, Roosevelt sort of wangled the Japanese into attacking us at Pearl Harbor, uh, the, the United States was not able to go into the war because of the major reactionary political elements here in the country. We'll talk about that here in, this, in the, the third portion of the, of the class. But the, the fact of the matter is that Germany, as you remember, had, had overrun France, was marching troops down the Saint-Élysée. You know, they, they were, in fact, uh, they'd, they'd firebombed uh, Poland and taken it over. They were firebombing England every day. And the United States still wasn't in the war. You know, so if the United States had not come in, and they were not able to come in because of the resistance of this kind of domestic, right-wing fascist set of elements in the country, the landed in the, the property classes, uh, in Brown Brothers Harriman, in, in Sullivan and Cromwell, and the other places in the country, uh, and the, the Germans would have taken over. And in that sense, you're probably correct that in fact it was clear, we've, we've learned that Hitler had planned once he solidified his power uh, in Europe, was planning to invade the United States. Uh, but he mistakenly instead prematurely invaded Russia and lost his fifth and sixth army in front of the gates of Stalingrad 
in 1942 and 43, uh, and so that they basically collapsed, you know. But but I don't I, I don't believe at this point in time that the United States, if it hadn't, it, because in fact it didn't follow Hamilton's recommendations to start with, and we'll we'll track this because it was in 1913 that they eventually established the Federal Reserve and they ended up giving the federal government the right to engage in direct taxation with the constitutional amendments, et cetera. And it was at that point when the, the United States federal government started muscling up uh, pursuant to Hamilton's proposals. But I, I think we probably would not have been over, overrun by any other country between you know, 1891 and 1913, okay? So, but we'll, we'll dig into that as we go in. Yeah. Well, 1812, 1812, they tried it. You know, but 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 it wasn't. They were marching at the. No, but no, no. That's what I'm saying. The the the. But but it is clear that in 1812 they attempted to they invaded uh, Washington D.C. and the United States without having without having in fact muscled up like Hamilton was proposing were able to repel them, and that was under the presidency of James Madison. But it did, and important is fair to point out, <clears throat> it did cause Madison to change his position on the federal bank, at the national bank. He allowed, he voted uh, to, he signed the bill to allow the bank to be set up to pay off the debt for the War of 1812. Okay, I rolled right through it there. Right? Okay, look, yes. I just had a question about um, something you said earlier. Yeah. Uh -huh. And other people with like Cheney and some of the like, conservatives of today. Yes. Um, but I also like when I've learned about Hamilton before, like I've learned things like a big federalist and like I've like the rhetoric of like right wing contemporary. Like I hear a lot of like less government, you know, like mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. don't want like a federal bank. So I don't know. I just wanted like a little more elaboration. Like, that's a, that that, that's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. That the the right wing reactionaries right now uh, find that that in light of the fact that they view liberals to have gained control over the federal government and are proposing policies like having national health insurance, social security, you know, women's rights, uh, more equal treatment for black people in minority groups, uh, increased minimum wage and stuff like that. What they've done is they've, they've retrenched into believing that if they can, can pull power back into the hands of the states, that they can, in fact, whip up the people now because of the vastly improved communication systems that they've got, of being able to, and, and you'll see it in the, in the article, one of the things that, that Madison spends a good deal of time talking about, and Dr. Sheehan quotes him at some length about that, is in fact suggesting that the, the people who are back in the states uh, have a, a much greater uh, access to kind of what the genuine feelings of the people really are than they do in Washington, D.C. And uh, he thought there that if they undertook an adequate uh, program, like we're talking about, of setting up the process where they gather together in their counties and, and uh, solicit public opinion and help educate people, et cetera, that they would be able to elevate the kind of consciousness of the people so that the people would in fact be proposing the same kind of natural law views that Madison thought that they would support. What, what the, the right wing believes now is that they can in fact use the new and increased communication systems to basically dominate the entire region. That the wealthiest, uh, wealthiest powers right now and corporations can dominate entire states and that they could in fact therefore have more reactionary policies because they can, like for example, it's perfectly clear. You take you take a look at uh, that Fox News, to pick one, you know that you, you take you take a look at Fox News. 
that when, when, when we're driving across the country and doing cases around the country and stuff like that, you know, you go into South Dakota where we're working on the Lakota case and you drive from one end of South Dakota to the other and you go down the dial on the radios in the car and all you get is one fascist rant after another. You know, I mean, you know, you, you go from, uh, you know, that, that, that whole saying is that uh, Rush Limbaugh, they say, you know, what's, what's the difference between Rush Limbaugh and the von Hindenburg? They say, you know, one of them is a big, fat, flaming bag of gas, and the other one's a dirigible. Uh, the, uh, the, the, bottom, the bottom line is, that was just an aside, that, uh, that, that you know, you, can, you go all across the Dakotas and the Midwest, and all you hear is Rush Limbaugh and Fox News, and you go into any kind of a barber shop, or it's Fox News is playing all the time, and anybody who just listens to Fox News uh, has, has this entire reactionary worldview. And the, the fact of the matter is that, that you can, that it's hard to break into that in the local area. You can't, you, you can't break into it. And so that they've now, the, the reactionaries uh, and the advocates of wealth and power like this are on the one hand uh, wanting to have the power residing in the states because they think that is their base of power. And that the liberals have figured out, again, through the use of media, and use the use of public education through probably national national public radio, you know, national public radio and the uh, public broadcasting system and Frontline and all these other kind of liberal uh, public television stations have somehow gotten the uh, the people on all the East Coast and West Coast to support their progressive positions, and so you, but you still see, for example, Obama in order to have won the Democratic Party nomination, found it necessary to argue that he was going to withdraw the U.S. military forces from Afghanistan. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, and, and McCain and all the others that were opposing him kept advocating putting in more troops and asserting more power. And so that you see there's a conflict even within the right wing because if, in fact, uh, McCain had been able to win the presidency, uh, they would have, you know, muscled up farther the United States military and put more military power in to seize and maintain the oil fields, primarily to enrich the same people that own the seven major oil companies, who end up being the same people that were attempting to overthrow the administration of Franklin Roosevelt in 1934. So it is, it is true that there, there are some pieces to this that seem to be contradictory to the kind of the simple overall thesis that those who would be in support of the centralized federal government are the right wing and that the, the progressives would be the ones that wanted to stay down in the states like they were here. But I think that the principal difference is, and, and he touched on it, is the issue of easier transportation, easier communication, and all those things, the very things that he was talking about, have in fact been seized by a lot of the major corporations. And they've come to control those means of, of, uh, of education, public education, and they've been able to indoctrinate the people on more and more conservative uh, uh, beliefs. <clears throat> there were a whole bunch of hands flying here, which is a good thing. Yeah. So, so it's not too much contradiction, and their banks, you know, where they plan to also have the experience. But they just, their banks are all offshore now. They have their own banking system now. So it's not, I don't see it as a contradiction. All right. So, so I, I hear you, but, but the, yes, Sophia. May I just ask? In a lot of ways, it seems that Hamilton's vision for the United States had won out, and in some ways, I see what. I see why that's problematic because I have to say that I can't stand Hamilton's views on the subject. But at the same time, would Madison's proposal have really been particularly practical? The idea of the United States being an agricultural power, I'm at that point perhaps, but the 
Industrial Revolution was happening in England, and being an agricultural power would have, I think, made England more inclined, I know this isn't a history class, but it would have made England more inclined to treat them like a colony, not less, because colonies generally were producing the raw materials to sell to British manufacturing. So, yeah. No, 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 no I, hear, I hear your question. I, I hear you say that the, what, Sorry, what, what kind of you, no, no. No, so what, the, what the, the real question here is, is that if in fact Madison had been basically uh, uncontested in the advocacy of his position, and uh, Jefferson and he and the, the other members of the Democratic Republican Party uh, had prevailed, uh, would that necessarily have been a good thing? Uh, because it might have naturally enough led to uh, eventually the United States being treated, in a sense, like a colony by England that was off and running on its industrial revolution, and that we would have been supplying the food and the, the other things, uh, but they'd be doing all the manufacturing. And they'd become more powerful and wealthier, et, et cetera. That is, in fact, one of the, the important arguments uh, on behalf of not totally demonizing those people, because the reality is, is that the the uh, the, the mercantile class and the industrialists uh, and the entrepreneurial class uh, have, in fact, contributed a very major uh, percentage of the energy that's gone into our country that's made us a major industrial power in the world, and that the the problem is, is that. If, in fact, you look at this objectively, which we're going to do, hopefully, in the third part of the class, the last third of the class, we're going to be looking at what the consequences have been of the balance that has been struck between these two schools of thought. Uh, after we spend some time in the second third of the course analyzing what this, what this contest looked like in the various decisions that were made by the court uh, as the forum within which this debate took place. <clears throat> in, in the, the I'm, I'm confronted by this right now because in writing the, the second book that I'm writing right now, uh, we're dealing with the issue, one of the issues we're dealing with is the assassination of President Kennedy. And it's evident now that the elements that were involved in greenlighting that assassination were exactly these elements, uh, the, the major wealthy uh, people that were Brown Brothers, Harriman, and, and, and Sullivan and Cromwell, and others, uh, in setting up the Central Intelligence Agency and their covert operations, and Alan Dulles, who was their lawyer, was the head of the CIA, and uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and so in that sense, you'd say, clearly they were out of control. Clearly that was a terrible thing for them to have done. Uh, but on the other hand, if they had never existed, uh, and the United States was basically from one end to another, uh, one uh, bio, bioneer community after another, you know, all living on solar power and eating rutabaga. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, I, don't, I don't think that it would have necessarily gone as far as our being overrun, uh, except for the issue of Germany. But the, the, the great solace is that it turns out that these are the same people that funded the Third Reich that rose to power in Germany and that they wouldn't have risen to power without them. So it's not at all clear that the, the, the German state, uh, even, if it, uh, even if it had come to be a dominant force in Europe, would have actually invaded the United States and overthrown us. So, uh, so what, what, I'm say, what I'm saying here is, is that this balance between the two elements, the kind of rural, agrarian, uh, kind of natural law kind of oriented grouping, and this kind of elitist, uh, secular, uh, domineering type of group uh, that has, it has come to be believed, basically, by the American public as a whole, that some kind of a balance between those two things is what we're really looking for. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, increase the role of the natural law intuitives and pull us back from those kind of excesses and to be able to rein back in the powers of industry to provide things that are maybe necessary, but not completely superfluous. 
uh, and we'll, but we'll get to that in part three uh, of, of the course, okay? There's other hands flying, yes. Well, the, the, it wasn't just Hamilton. I mean, the, virtually all the people, all the Federalists, including uh, Madison, you know, saw that the Articles of Confederation were inadequate. Now, in, in, it leads to this very point, inadequate in what way? What it was is that it was making it difficult even for the agrarian uh, elements in the colonies to coordinate with each other that they couldn't trade without a, a set of standard measurements and weights, et cetera, uh, and that they, one, one colony was putting taxes on the products from another one, and it wasn't in a coordinated fashion. The, the, the question that I hear you asking behind it is, is that, uh, isn't it clear that, in, in your sense, Hamilton and his followers who were advocating the, the more powerful central government had a lot of good things to be said for them, Yes, but I'm saying that the, the sense that it was only their side of that dialogue that was advocating the new central government is not accurate because even the intuitionists were advocating a stronger central government uh, for various reasons that didn't go quite so far as Hamilton would have gone and ended up going, advocating the stronger military, major dominance of the, of the industrial class and the moneyed class and all of that. He, he carried on his his uh, advocacy to the, even after the government had been established to try to establish a, a major kind of increase in the power uh, of that group from what it had been established in the actual founding of the Constitution itself. But one of the, one of the main things you learn about the Constitution is that there was a self, you've heard it a hundred times probably, a self-conscious compromise that was struck in the crafting of the Constitution itself that is represented by the, the separate in passage of the two parts of it. The setting up of the first three articles of the affirmative positive government, which is kind of the Hamiltonian elitist type of government, and then coming in right behind it with the, the kind of uh, the uh, Madisonian uh, articles and Bill of Rights uh, limiting the power of that. And so, so that is symptomatic of the, the kind of partnership that went on between these two elements at the time. But both of them agreed that there had to be a stronger federal government. It wasn't, it wasn't just the Hamiltonians. In the Fe well, that, that they, one can safely say that if it hadn't been for the countervailing force of the, of Mad the Madisonians and the Jeffersonians pushing back against the guys, uh, the Hamiltonians, et cetera, that they would have established a federal government that, number one, had no Bill of Rights in it, <laughs> number one, uh, and that they would have established a much more elitist uh, form of structures uh, than they actually were forced to do. The, the likelihood is, is that they would have, they would have had, while well, they had the state legislature uh, of each of the, the colonies being elected only by white adult males over the age of 21 that were property owners or income makers that were taxed, that, that they probably would have had the legislatures of the, of, the count, of the colonies select the Congress people, the congressmen, as well as the senators and the president. That there would have been a completely kind of uh, elitist type of government on, on the federal level that would have been selected by just the state legislatures, you see? Uh, and that there probably would have been a, a much greater, obviously a much greater inclination to set up a, a federal bank right at the very beginning, like Hamilton wanted to do. Uh, they would have, uh, would have wanted to go right straight to funding the industrialists like they wanted to do. They would have gotten away with passing the Alien and Sedition Acts and keeping them in place. So that they're, they're, you, can, you can track what their, their agenda would have been like if they'd been uncontested. By, by the Madisonians. 
Uh, and what happened is the Madisonians, the Jeffersonians and Madisonians actually uh, ascended into the ascendancy uh, uh, soon after the government was established for that entire period of, of uh, Jefferson and Madison and Monroe and, and those people. There was a whole chain of, of presidents and legislatures that were dominated by the Republican and uh, the Democratic Republican Party. Okay, and so that there was a, it wasn't until the American Civil War that the industrialists basically vanquished the agrarians. And, uh, and the industrialists rose into the ascendancy and gave rise to the entire uh, robber baron era. And it's, it's consequent imperialism and increased militarism and all of that. The white man's burden and, and all of that. So we saw, we saw them in kind of full flower uh, the Hamiltonians, we saw them in sort of full flower during the robber baron era. Uh, and so, we, so the question that we're going to be faced with in the third part of the course is what lessons have we learned about how to get them back under control? Okay? So now we're, we're, we're at the question and answer period. We'll do a few minutes here and then we'll, we have to, have to escape from here and get over to our, our, other, our other room for the full questions. Rose into the ascendancy. Yeah, I've never heard that term. All right, that's right. What, what, what is it? Well, it just what it means that they became more dominant, uh, that they rose, they, they ascended into the, the kind of position of primacy, and that they basically asserted themselves uh, all through that period. And so they, they, had, they had a run, they had a, a major run that went on from 1868 to 1929. I mean, that entire operation that went down uh, and if that if that had uh, if they hadn't collapsed in 1929 if they'd been able to uh, to exercise greater self-restraint uh, that uh, who knows what would have happened uh, we certainly wouldn't have gotten you know four terms of Franklin Roosevelt coming in trying to put them under control you know and and, and we saw with the, with the coming to office of the people at the end of the Cold War, we saw them starting to strip away one after another, one after another of the Franklin Roosevelt constraints on, on trusts and banks and other things to allow the banks to start engaging in the very kind of activity that they engaged in that brought about the Great Recession of 2008. Again, and just missed, escaped, you know, getting into another major worldwide depression. Okay, so look at let's let's get let's get on over to uh, to a porter, uh, and so we don't get thrown out of this room. Uh, okay, and we'll.